Hello everyone, welcome to episode 39 of our weekly Cricket Her podcast. It's nearly Christmas, Sid. Uh, who'd have thought it <laughs> already? And um, this week we are mainly going to be talking about the next T20 World Cup in South Africa. So a couple of weeks ago, um, we it was announced that it is going to be delayed to being in 2023 instead of the original plan, which was for it to be in 2022. And we didn't talk about that at the time. So what do you make of that decision, Sid? Well, I guess that's the right decision. It's kind of knock on from COVID and the fact that the 50 over World Cup was pushed back a year. That was going to leave, if things had stayed as they were, um, a 50 over World Cup, a 20 over World Cup and uh, the Commonwealth Games, um, which is kind of effectively another World Cup, um, all in the same year. So mm -hmm. what they've done um, is pushed the 20 over uh, World Cup back into 2023. So I guess that's the right decision to have taken. Yeah. Cool. And um, one of the reasons why we're talking about that now is that we've actually ha heard the official qualification process um, for that World Cup. We've, it, the ICC have announced what that is going to look like. Um, so this is what we know. It's going to be another 10-team World Cup, similarly to the one that was held in Australia earlier this year. Um, the, so South Africa will qualify automatically by, being, by virtue of being the host. Um, and then the seven other top ranked teams will also qualify. Um, so I think that's exactly the same as last time around. And then the bottom two um, who competed in the, the last World Cup, so that's likely to be uh, Bangladesh and Thailand, we think, um, will then um, have to compete for their place in the official qualifying tournament for the World Cup. And then um, over the next couple of years, there will then be these regional qualifying tournaments, um, the first of which I think is going to be in Scotland in August 2021. So we're kind of excited about that um, and possibly thinking about even going. You never know. Um, although I think there's been some discussion about the fact that there are no reserve days and the weather in Scotland in August is variable. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so there'll be regional qualifiers um, and actually the ICC are bigging up the fact that there's going to be 10 more teams in those regional qualifiers um, than there were last time around. So I think last time there were 37 and this time there's going to be 47, something like that. So that's really exciting. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the news as it stands. What do you make of all that, Sid? Well, I think what we're seeing is a kind of a, a little bit of a long term shift in the way that the global game uh, is working um, within the women's game. And I think that probably within the men's game as well, things are kind of similar. The, but in the women's game, for a long time, we had, you know, the, the top tier nations, if you like, the, the, the places where cricket's traditionally been played by women and by men. Um, so, you know, the England's and New Zealand's and Australia's and South Africa's. And then we had some other countries uh, in the women's game that um, were developed a degree of strength. We had Denmark were actually kicking around for quite a long time, the Netherlands um, and those other countries where, you know, the women's game started to gain a bit of a foothold and then never quite took off. Um, and then that was largely it, that there were, you know, huge swathes of the mm -hmm. globe where there was no women's cricket, no international women's cricket mm -hmm. team. Um, what we're starting to see now is that um, lots and lots of other countries, particularly countries in Africa uh, and the countries in South America, like Brazil and Argentina, um, are starting to, you know, uh, put, put teams forward for these international tournaments. So what we're, what we're getting is that um, we're kind of seeing uh, three tiers emerge, if you like. We've still got our top tier, which is our Englands and Australias and things. And then we've got um, a lot of teams in, in the kind of emerging tier, uh, the teams like your, your, your Brazils and your Argentinas and your Mozambiques. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got this small group in the middle, and there's this small group in the middle that's concerning me a little bit, and that's the teams like... Bangladesh and uh, Thailand and Ireland and Scotland, those teams where women's cricket is a little bit more established. You know, they've got some players that are good enough to play professionally, mm -hmm. as Scotland have with the Bryce sisters, you know, as Ireland have with some of their top players. Um, and uh, it's, it's these teams that are kind of sitting in a sort of awkward middle at the moment that are finding things a bit difficult. Mm. They're the teams that are not going to qualify directly. They're going to have to go through a qualifying process. Uh, 
um, into quite a small World Cup. They might not quite make it through that qualifying process. And that's where I think that we need to open things up a bit more in the future to try and um, provide a better pathway for those teams to break into the top tier. Okay, so one of the questions or one of the things that Hypercourse has been talking about on Twitter recently is that we should be opening up um, the 20 over World Cup and also I guess the 50 over World Cup, um, which is only eight teams, the 20 over World Cup will be 10 teams. I think he's talking about there being something like, he, he thinks ideally it should be like 16 teams or something. Um, and that would obviously account for some of those teams that you're talking about there. So would you be in favour of that? Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely something I'd like to see. I think what we're trying to, what we're trying to get to here is a situation where ultimately we've got more teams that can challenge at the very highest level, mm -hmm. where we've got more teams that could potentially win that World Cup. Um, and I think that, you know, we've got our, you know, six or seven teams at the top at, at, at the moment. Um, and we, we're trying to expand that. And in order for teams like your, your Ireland and Bangladesh and those, team, those teams at that level to kind of break into that top tier, what they need is a degree of security. They need the security that they will be able to compete in these competitions going forwards, that they will almost certainly qualify, and that therefore they can kind of bank on the money coming in. And the money coming in is, you know, is, is really important here. But the other thing that's important here is they want to be able to tell the players that, you know, that they can compete in a World Cup. They don't want it to go, well, you might be able to compete in a World Cup if, you know, if things go well and this happens and that happens. Um, you know, we've seen directly in Ireland that hockey has been able to take players from cricket um, over the last five or six years because hockey has been able to offer players the chance to play in a World Cup final, whereas cricket have, have had to go, well, you know, if you're lucky, you might go to be able to go to Australia um, and, you know, compete in the World Cup itself. Um, and that is a big deal when these players are going to be largely mm -hmm. amateurs. If you start offering them, you know, opportunities to, you know, be genuinely competitive, then that's important. So what I would like to see is that the World Cup expanded to a degree that ensures that teams like Ireland and Bangladesh can bank on almost certainly being able to qualify and then expanded sufficiently below that to still give some of the lower tier nations the chance to punch upwards and to come through a qualifying tournament and to kind of win their final and win their World Cup by just, just being there in the way that Thailand were on this occasion. So that's what I'd like to see. That's interesting. I don't necessarily disagree with you. But I think that we've got slightly more fundamental problems than the ones that you describe. And I don't know that the way to fix them is, or I don't know that just expanding your World Cups is a way that you actually address some of the really core problems. You touched on one of them there, actually, which is the fact that even if you are an island or a Bangladesh and you get into the World Cup, um, that still doesn't address what I think is actually potentially a bigger issue, which is the gap between Australia um, and, and Bangladesh or Ireland then still is, is yawning. Um, it's kind of this chasm that, um, you know, that, 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 that none of this really addresses. So I think that, that that's a bit difficult. Um, and that's, um, you know, that's, well, maybe that's a discussion for a whole other podcast. Um, but so there's that. Um, but the other thing is, even if your focus is very much on trying to develop some of those teams. Um, I think that there are quite big problems in just saying, oh, well, putting them in the World Cup solves everything. So obviously um, putting them in the World Cup does, does do a few things. So one of them is it gives your players, as you, as you were saying, something to aim at um, and something to work towards. And we've seen during COVID um, when, there's, when there's no cricket um, you know, in the foreseeable future, that actually makes it really difficult to motivate the players to keep training. Um, but I think that to some extent, these regional qualifiers and being in the qualifying tournament, which, you know, Ireland are almost certainly going to win the European regional qualifier, aren't they, and end up in the in the main qualifying tournament. Um, that in itself gives players something to aim at, something to work towards, doesn't it? So there's that. Um, a couple of other things, though. Um, the, the One of the things um, that's important about being in a World Cup is the money aspect, isn't it? So you get money from the ICC for being in a World Cup. But I suppose I kind of think, well, um, if the ICC has got that money knocking around, then isn't there a way of more fairly distributing it so that it doesn't hinge on qualifying for a World Cup in order to get that money? Um, so, you know, for a country like Ireland, actually, it becomes a vicious circle because if they don't have the money to pay their players to be, be semi-professional, they're not going to be able to compete um, and therefore they, they won't qualify for World Cups. Um, but then they need to qualify for the World Cups in order to get the money. So I think that there's actually there's a flawed logic there in, in the way that the ICC allocates some of these resources. So that's one point. Um, and the other point is about um, 
you know, the one thing that we hear a lot is that it, it you know, the great thing about being in a World Cup for some for a country like Thailand is that well they got to uh, they got to play against the top countries by doing that they got to play against England for example, um, and that's brilliant. But um, in a way, all that does is give you one match against each of the top nations every four years. That's all it does. Um, so let's take Ireland as an example. You know, a few years ago. Um, when Australia, for example, were over here in England for the Women's Ashes in 2013, they went over to Ireland in the middle of the series and they played some matches against Ireland. I think they played three T20s. Um, and what a brilliant opportunity for those Irish players. But that seems to not be happening now. Um, last time around, when um, the last time Australia were in England for the Ashes, um, they had um, an Australia A team here and there was an England Academy team and they just swapped. And they played each other internally, didn't they? Um, and so no, no matches there for Ireland, no opportunity there for the, for the Irish players to develop. Now, if you are one of these teams um, that isn't quite, as you say, isn't quite managing to scrape into the top tier at the moment, um, actually, wouldn't it be more useful for your development to play, say, a series of three matches um, against, these top, against these top nations? And actually... There was a brilliant opportunity for that to happen really recently when England this summer, or our English summer 2020, at the last minute, scrabbling round with South Africa and India, India both having dropped out of the planned series, scrabbling round looking for an opponent. And so Claire Connor gets on the phone to the West Indies and says, oh, will you come over here? And that's what happened. Um, but but in, the, in the background, you've got Ireland kind of waving going, hello, Claire, we're here, we exist, and we're only a few miles away, and it will be much cheaper for you to charter a flight from Dublin to Derby than it would be to charter one from Barbados to Derby. Yeah, I mean, I guess the the uh, the ECB were concerned that if they played Ireland, it would be a hopelessly one-sided series that ended in you know a sort of five-nil victory for England and was ultimately completely meaningless. So instead, we played the West Indies and got a yeah. <laughs> Well, exactly. My point completely. So how frustrating must that have been for, for Ireland to be, to be looking on and thinking, well, that could have been us. Um, and actually, there does seem to be an attitude on behalf of some of these boards, a real aversion now to going and playing against countries like Ireland that didn't exist a few years ago. So I think that that's really worrying. Um, and I don't think that giving teams the chance to play countries like England and Australia just as a one-off you know, winner takes all World Cup match every four years. It doesn't. It doesn't cut the mustard for me, frankly. So, um, I I'm sympathetic to these arguments, but I do think that sometimes they miss the point, which is that there needs to be a more fundamental shift in some of these in some of these aspects. Okay. Okay, and finally this week, you may have noticed our background. So, Sid, do you want to explain what our background is all about? Well, a couple of weeks ago, we ordered ourselves an early Christmas present to be um, shipped all the way from Australia, um, and it arrived this week, and here it is. So, it's this beautiful book. It's called Clearing Boundaries. It's been produced by the Bradman Foundation, um, who um, are, well, I guess, I guess a little bit sort of like the equivalent of the Lord's Taverners to a certain mm. extent. They do some charitable work and, you know, sort of promote cricket, and mm -hmm. they... They've got a museum and a, a library and things. Uh, and anyway, they've produced this wonderful book, which is a sort of coffee table book. It's large, as you can see. It's nearly as, nearly as big as my head, nearly as big as Raph's Christmas hat. <laughs> um, and it's, it's uh, about an inch thick, and it's just packed with um, lovely photographs mm. from the history of the game, yeah. going right back to the early days of, of women's international cricket, taking us right through. There's the 2009-2010 uh, World Cup. Um, there's lots of text as well to support the photographs, so you, you know you've got the the explanation of what it is that you're looking at, and it's just it's just really beautifully done. Mm. Um, and I can thoroughly recommend any women's cricket fan to send off for this as a Christmas present for themselves because it is so worth it. So, Raf, what what are the details? How will, how will people get this book if they want to buy their own copy? Yeah, so if you go to the website of the um of the Bradman Foundation, um, which is bradman.com.au, and you can order a copy from the website. Um, I think that's how we ordered ours, isn't it? So um, it might take a little while to arrive, although we were pleasantly surprised by how quickly ours got here. Um, but yeah, it's just beautiful, and I totally echo what you just said, Sid. Get yourself a copy right now. 
So that's all for this week. Um, we will be doing another vlogcast next week. At some point, we're going to have to do a year-end vlogcast, aren't we? But the point is, next week, it'll be a week closer to Christmas, and I'm really excited. See you then. Bye.